the stamp of Little England, or a necessary way to balance the books in a pandemic. The government defeats a rebellion over cuts to foreign aid spending. With living former Prime Ministers queuing up to say international development spending should be a line in the sand, the current PM told MPs the aid budget has fallen victim to the costs of the pandemic. Also tonight, as crowds gathered around the Marcus Rashford mural in solidarity, the Home Secretary Priti Patel stays silent on claims she stoked the fire by not condemning fans who booed players that took the knee. And more than 400 British soldiers lost their lives in the heat of battle in Afghanistan. As the Taliban begins to dominate once again, Seema Katech has been asking some of the soldiers who served there, was it worth it? It seems as though it was all in vain. And, you know, their lives were lost ultimately for what? Good evening. No government holds a vote it might not win if it doesn't have to. So when this one announced Parliament would be voting on plans to lock in cuts to foreign aid spending at 0.5% of national income instead of the 0.7% promised in its manifesto, it was a sign it felt it had brought enough Conservative rebels back into the fold. Sure enough, this afternoon MPs voted by a majority of 35 in favour of a decision ministers argue is temporary and necessary to keep public debt down. As the Prime Minister put it in today's debate, the aid budget has fallen victim to the £407 billion his government's been compelled to spend on the pandemic. Every other living Prime Minister is against the move, which Sir John Major tonight condemned as the stamp of Little England, not Great Britain. Theresa May said the cuts, which amount to around £4 billion, will mean fewer girls will be educated, more girls and boys will become slaves, more children will go hungry and more of the poorest people in the world will die. Here's our political editor, Nick Watt. A vision to remake Britain. And a renewed commitment to a defining creed of modern conservatism. Devoting a sizeable chunk of our national income to overseas aid. Here is the route map to take us an overall package which helped Boris Johnson to an emphatic victory in the 2019 general election. But with the nation's finances buffeted by the worst economic downturn in centuries, a breach now of that core manifesto pledge to meet the UN target of spending 0.7% of gross national income on aid. But everyone will accept that when you're suddenly compelled to spend £407 billion on sheltering our people from an economic hurricane never experienced in living memory, there must inevitably be consequences for other areas of public spending. And the Prime Minister diffused a backbench Conservative rebellion by putting two manifesto pledges side by side. Yes, said the Prime Minister, to returning to the 0.7% aid target at the right time. But that time won't be right, he cautioned, until another manifesto pledge is met. No borrowing to fund day-to-day -day government spending and debt levels must be falling. It seems that four billion pounds is really... Two new fiscal tests which did little to impress one unlikely rebel. We made a promise to the poorest people in the world. The government has broken that promise. This motion means that promise may be broken for years to come. With deep regret. I will vote against the motion today. Amen. The eyes to the right, 333. The nose to the left, 298. The eyes have it, the eyes have it, a lock. A win for the government. A happy Chancellor who just saved £4 billion and who also effectively secured Parliament's agreement that any spending beyond his plans would mean tax rises or cuts elsewhere. Relief and smiles in government after ministers saw off a potentially dangerous rebellion. It's not every day that a former Prime Minister risks the naughty step. The rebels said they had 60. Where were they all? One cabinet minister gloated to me. But there is one underlying story here. After a year of writing checks, this most canny of chancellors has tightened the fiscal rules with implications for his party 
and for his next door neighbour, who does rather like to spend. The Chancellor has, I think you could say, confronted his colleagues with the consequences of spending public money, uh, reminded them that there are lots of other areas where they might want to be spending public money, and you could regard it almost as an opening salvo in the upcoming spending review, with the Chancellor, I think, you know, shooting across not just the bows of Tory backbenchers, but also possibly across the bows of the Prime Minister. Come up with quite a clever route. Defeat for the rebels, but the fight continues for their vision of global Britain. Well, it shows it's alive and well within the Conservative Party as much as it is within the opposition parties, because people do believe in the impact of foreign aid spend, but clearly not enough of us. Um, you know, we do have to accept that the circumstances are different from when we won the election in 2019. I think everyone recognises that. Um, but there are still a great many people on the benches who may not have voted with me tonight, but voted with the government and who also recognise the need of 0.7% in the future. And we'll keep that torch alive. A country still proud of its global reach, but time now to put our own house in order before earlier ambitions can be fulfilled. Well, joining me now are Sarah Champion, Labour MP for Rotherham and Chair of the International Development Select Committee, and George Freeman, Conservative MP for Mid Norfolk and former Transport Minister. And George Freeman, let's let's start with you. Sir John Major said today the government's broken its word and should be ashamed, and that it's the stamp of Little England, not Great Britain. He's right, isn't he? No, I, I disagree. I mean, he's made clear his opposition to the Prime Minister um, on all grounds, really. And I, for me, look, I take aid really seriously. I take our aid commitment seriously. Two years ago, I was in Lebanon. I've hitchhiked through Africa. I've been to the Peshawar Valley and Kashmir. I really believe in our aid commitment. And if I felt that this, was, that this was undermining our commitment to global Britain, I'd have voted against it. Let's be really clear. But I don't. And the reason is, firstly, uh, this is completely unprecedented. I think the public know that COVID has... Uh, hit our public finances. Uh, it's a crisis we've never seen before. We're back to levels of debts not seen since the war. Every pound we spend, we're borrowing. And I needed to hear the Chancellor today, as he did, say that this is temporary. And he and the Prime Minister have both said, both to me and in the House, we're going back to 0.7. And more than that, they've set a clear roadmap to how we do it, with the OBR holding our feet to the flames. But how can it not undermine the commitment to global Britain? We've been hearing you know, the head of water aid talking about how it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of lives. To cut aid for life-saving water and sanitation in the middle of the worst pandemic for 100 years is unconscionable, he said. Mary Stopes said last week they've already closed down their team in Nigeria that's reaching the most marginalised communities. Christian aid in South Sudan, said they, they said their funding's gone. Here's how. Uh, three, uh, there are three reasons. I mean, there is a big aid industry and they will be suffering tonight and I understand their complaints. But here's why it needn't. Firstly, we spend 10 billion a year on aid. That's after the 0.2% reduction. And that goes on humanitarian aid at the top of the pyramid. Uh, very important humanitarian relief and stabilisation, as I saw in the Bekaa Valley in Syria. And then what's called the longer term sustainable uh, resilience programmes, where people have seen us contributing to the Indian Space Programme and other projects. It'll be down in those things that we cut. We're not going to cut the humanitarian aid, the really important uh, um, stabilisation work. But also there's something else. The UK already commits way more on top of our ODA commitment. So on peacekeeping, 400 million a year, not included in the ODA budget. On diplomacy, we're the third biggest network in the world. On tariffs, by reducing the European Union's 40% tariffs on food from Africa, that's a billion pound a year commitment to trade for the poorest nations. On WHO, we're increasing, increasing our spend by 30%. On Gavi, we've funded over 1.3 billion vaccines exporting internationally. On COVAX, half a billion, we're the biggest donor. This is all outside ODA. Honestly, I... if I felt we were becoming a little England party, of retreat from global challenges. I wouldn't be voting for this. Well, That's not what we're doing. Let's bring in Sarah Champion. I saw you shaking your head at that point where George Freeman was saying, you know, it's not going to hit humanitarian aid. What's your reaction to that and to what's uh, happened? Well, it is. Um, I mean, at the moment, uh, my committee, the International Development Select Committee, is doing an inquiry looking specifically at the future of UK aid. And we've had 93 organisations who have come to us who have already faced these cuts. What we're seeing, though, with the vote today is two things. One, it was an absolute slapdown for the Conservatives who were trying to honour their manifesto commitment, which this government seems to have thrown on a pyre. Um, but also what we're seeing is, is just the start, I believe, believe of the unpicking of the aid programme that we should be incredibly proud of in this country. 
A, because it's the right thing to do, but B, because it gets us a seat at every global table. And it gives us such incredible international standing. You know, we're seen as a country that does the right thing, that stands by the world, come thick or thin. And, and we're just literally giving that away. And the thing that concerns me most is, as we're giving away our soft power, other nations, and I'm thinking specifically of Russia and China, they're stepping right in there. And that should be something that concerns all of us. And, and what about this point? a fairly important point that we need to balance the books. We've spent £407 billion on the pandemic so far and something has to give and this is the first thing that does. Um, absolutely understand that and built in the legislation around aid is as our economy drops so does our proportion of contribution so that was there already but it's also about about making choices and we need to be very clear this was a political choice so basically almost exactly the same amount of money that's been cut out of the aid budget has been put into the defense budget so they are prioritizing um, children's health over choosing to buy nuclear weapons. It's as blunt as that. But also, I know that George has been to Lebanon and has written about it. Um, we're choosing to pay for 200 million for a royal yacht that we don't need or you know, have any particular desire for. And that's the exact amount of money that this financial year is being cut out of the aid to Lebanon, a country where 80% of families can't afford food also a key strategic country in the middle in the middle east so we are making choices this isn't about saving money this is about some bizarre political posturing and i don't know what the strategy is behind all of this if i did maybe i'd be more sympathetic or george, george freeman says he'll tell you i'd like you to also Great. answer the question perhaps that ties in with that which is it's political how does it play out on the doorstep is this a, is this popular on the doorsteps is that what you find uh I have no idea, um, but I, it, this is not a political decision, it's an economic decision taken by the Chancellor. Let me just deal with the points that Sarah made, and I hugely respect her work, but I noticed she didn't come back on the list of things, very specific, very substantial things we're doing outside of ODA. It's not a retreat, Sarah, you just can't make an argument that um, we're retreating, because we're leading in commitments on top of our aid budget. But here's the strategy. If we, we're investing in levelling up and skills, uh, COVID has been an economic catastrophe in the UK as we end the furloughing and we've stepped in and provided the most extraordinary support to Sarah's constituents as well as mine and I would argue the public wanted that. The most important thing is we minimise economic scarring and through the levelling up programme and the skills programme we're going to see a transition from old jobs to new. The quicker we can do that, the quicker we grow our economy and the quicker we get back to 0.5% of a bigger economy and then quicker we get back to 0.7% of a bigger economy. It's firstly about the slice of the cake. So this is a strategy about getting back quickly to growth. And secondly, it's about making sure that every pound we spend goes to the most important frontline humanitarian and stabilisation efforts. We're and Sarah not Champion, this is temporary. This is what they're saying. Where, do you believe that? No, I don't believe that because the double lock that they've put on makes it so incredibly difficult to ever meet um, the, the criteria to enable us to go back to 0.7. That for me, uh, I, I cannot see this as a temporary measure. What I actually think is going on is more, and, it, and one of your um, uh, speakers spoke about it earlier, it's more, I think, there could be a political play going on here between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Because what I was seeing and what I was hearing was the Prime Minister actually saying, you know, we are going to be going back to 0.7. We're going to be doing that in, in the short term. It was a clear priority for him. And also his, his real desire around things like girls' education, for example, all of that is being swept away and he's being made to look like a hypocrite. The only person that's benefiting from this is Mr Sunak. And I think he has some warped idea about what does play, particularly on the northern doorstep. And he's wrong about that. And, and I, I just can't bear the fact that we're seeing some of the poorest people in the world being played off against some of the poorest people in this country because of this power grab that appears to be going on. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. You are about to speak, well, but I'm afraid... We are afraid the biggest donor to the World Bank uh, and to the African Development Bank. We're going to have to wrap it up. Sarah Champion, George Freeman, thank you so much for coming in. Now, earlier this evening, hundreds of people gathered for an anti-racism vigil at the Marcus Rashford mural in Withington, Greater Manchester, which was defaced after England lost the Euros final on Sunday night. The team's defeat sparked a torrent of racist abuse, primarily aimed at the three players, including Rashford, who missed penalties. The mural has been 
uh, restored by the artist who created it, but it will take more than a new coat of paint to restore the sense that developed through the tournament that England and English football had changed. Yesterday, the England manager, Gareth Southgate, Southgate said he'd been told that a lot of the abuse aimed at his black players, though by no means all of it, had come from abroad. David Grossman's been looking at the story behind the hate. Covering up racist abuse in a positive way. A defaced mural in Manchester of England star Marcus Rashford, today dotted with supportive messages. But when it comes to either covering up or removing racist abuse online, well, it appears far harder. The US-UK-based pressure group, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, identified and then reported 105 different accounts that they say had directed racist abuse at England footballers. In the vast majority of cases, they say nothing happened. We found that around 1 in 20 had any action taken against them. So why don't the social media companies act? The real problem has been that there is no incentive for them to do so, or rather there's no disincentive for them not taking action. And that's because for the main part, our regulators and legislators have failed to actually put into place a cohesive regulatory framework that would require them to take action to enforce their own terms and conditions, their community standards as they call them, and make their platforms places where people can exist without facing abuse on a daily basis. But if the social media companies in California won't intervene, some say the government here should compel them. I think that the UK government has been sleeping at the wheel. To be perfectly honest, the SEAL report, which was published by the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, it clearly stated as a public policy priority to combat anonymous racial abuse on social media. And I think that further down the line, the UK government also needs to introduce new laws, which include tougher penalties against those who are guilty of racially motivated offences and crimes. Attention is now focused on trying to discover who is behind the racist abuse. But without access to the social media company's data, for example, IP addresses, it's not really possible to come to any definitive conclusions. However, what we found out suggests that the majority of the abuse came from outside the UK. The Centre for Countering Digital Hate identified 105 accounts on Instagram that had directed racist abuse towards Marcus Rashford, Bakayo Saka and Jadon Sancho in the hours after the final of the European Championship. Newsnight has analysed the posts for clues as to where the person behind them was posting from. Nine of the accounts are no longer active. For 32 accounts, there wasn't enough information to make any sort of assessment. But for 59, the evidence suggests that they are outside the UK. In fact, for only five out of the 105, did it appear that the account was from someone inside the UK. Obviously, this is not definitive and only a snapshot, but it is perhaps an instructive one. I think that we can't rule out the possibility of hostile foreign state activity. For some time, we've... Uh, seen revisionist and authoritarian regimes looking to exploit social fault lines, racial tensions in Western societies. So we can't rule out that possibility. I mean, one of the ironies of the internet is that, of course, it flattens our experience. So someone from overseas abusing a, uh, a British footballer is treated on that platform as an equal. And in fact, ironically, because the algorithms advantage the most engaging content, which doesn't just mean the, the most interesting or the most valuable content, but actually that which induces a reaction. Abuse induces the strongest possible reaction. We saw that on Sunday, people actually arguing back saying, please don't be racist. But because of that, the algorithms push forward that content and show it to more and more people, actually then deepening that schism in our society. On one level, where the abuse comes from makes no difference to the hurt and offence that it causes. But on another, it does perhaps tell us something about what we need to do about it. David Grossman there. Now, the Home Secretary hasn't responded to the accusation by England player Tyrone Mings that she stoked the fire by failing to condemn fans who booed his squad taking the knee ahead of their matches. Today, the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, said the players had his full respect. 
and the high-profile Brexiteer Steve Baker has told a group of Conservative MPs the party urgently needs to challenge its attitude towards taking the knee. The motivation for the team, of course, for what Ms Patel has called gesture politics, was to expose structural inequalities. Lewis Goodall is at the wall to take a look at the data. Yes, Casey, as you say, there's been so much discussion about taking the knee, about whether it is, as Priti Patel said, gesture politics. Now, of course, behind this conflict is the question of structural racism and whether the UK is structurally racist. We'll return to that term in a moment, but first, some facts. Now, much of the discussion around these things started with police, so let's take a look at police and policing. This is the Home Office's own data and stop and search race for ethnic minorities compared to white people. And as you can see, it is stark. BME people overall four times more likely to be whites to, than whites to be stopped and searched. Asian British three times more likely than whites to be stopped and searched. Black British nearly 10 times more likely. Now looking at arrests made, not a single police force in England or Wales registered an arrest, let an arrest rate of less than 20 for every thousand black people. By contrast, not a single police force in England and Wales registered an arrest rate of more than 20 for every thousand white people. Now, perhaps part of the reason for that could be, some might argue, the structural breakdown of our police force. Nearly 93% of the force are white. 14% of the population, by contrast, aren't. 1.3% of the police force are black. That compares to 3.3% of the population. 3.1% of officers are Asian versus 6% of officers of the population and so on. Which brings us on to another element which is of course how diverse the England football team is and the question of why the country doesn't look a little bit more, the, the, why the country doesn't look a bit more like them. Society doesn't look more like them. They look like England but much of the top prof professions in England don't. And given that they don't, why not? Let's take judges as one example. Only 1.1% of court judge judges across the country are black. 3.6% of court judges across the country are Asian, compared to 92.6% who are white. It is getting better with barrister intake over time, but there's a long way to go. And it is a picture that is repeated across many professions. No BAME permanent secretaries of the civil service. No BAME chief constables. Very few BAME university vice chancellors. Only 2% of academics are black. Nearly 95% of journalists are white. Some professions, like frontline medicine, do have a better story to tell. But then, for example, in business, there are fewer than a dozen BAME CEOs or chairs of the FTSE 250 leading companies from a ethnic minority. One recent report said that it would take until 20 44 to get th to get 13 percent of the country's top leadership positions filled by ethnic minorities by which time 20 percent of the population will be an ethnic minority now only nine bame ceos or chairs of the FTSE 250 leading companies are from an ethnic minority as i said the picture is uh, extremely stark indeed by the time you would get you as i say you need to get until 2044 to get 13 percent of the country's top leadership positions filled by ethnic minorities. Now, the question you have to ask is why? Is this about conscious racial discrimination on behalf of individuals, or is the system itself failing ethnic minorities? Now, if you conclude that it's the latter, well, that is what the idea of structural racism literally is. Racism is structural by its nature, and part of the problem is we've kind of confused the individual stuff um, with the actual you know, societal stuff. I mean, when you say structural racism, you're basically saying that we have a political economic system which produces um, real stark inequalities. Now, the government's Independent Commission on Race and Disparities report concluded that, that there we, they no longer see a Britain where the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. But of course, critics say the point is it doesn't have to be deliberate, but simply a reflection of the deep structural and historical forces at work in society. For example, racial inequalities intersect with other questions like class and wealth. Let's take unemployment since the pandemic. Remarkable this in many ways. Virtually all the increase we've seen in unemployment during the pandemic has been driven by ethnic minorities. Why unemployment has remained static, partly, probably because they were more likely to be furloughed. Black unemployment, meanwhile, is still about three times white unemployment, although, as you can see here, it has fallen in recent months. Wealth, as well, is enormously unevenly spread 
across racial groups. You can see that following the, this graph shows that the percentage of families with less than a thousand pounds in savings broken down by racial group. That's 60 percent for black Africans compared to 28 percent for whites or 25 percent for Indians. Overall, an average Bangladeshi family has only £31,000 in total assets versus a white British family of £197,000. And let's take a look at something especially topical. Covid death rates, white people here at one as the average. Every other ethnic group apart from white Irish you can see here more likely to die from Covid. Bangladeshis more than twice as likely. And that really brings together some of the other inequalities we've talked about already and more besides. So you can have a debate about why, about why all of this arises. Not everything is gloomy. Some things are getting better. Some things, though, are glacial. You can dismiss the idea of structural racism, the idea that society is inadvertently or otherwise rigged against minorities. But if you do that, of course, you have to have another explanation for all those disparities that we've talked about and many more besides. What is without question is that these disparities most certainly exist they are stark indeed, and it is they to which proponents have taken the knee say they're trying to draw attention. Thanks, Lewis. And I'm joined now by Assistant Player Manager for Livingston FC, Marvin Bartley, and by the former England international, Leanne Sanderson. And M M Marvin, both of you, thanks so much for joining us. Marvin, let's start with you. You know, you've had many years in top flight football in Scotland. What have you experienced when it comes to racism and how does it affect you? Yeah, you know, I've experienced racism a few times whilst being in Scotland. Uh, the first time was via Twitter when I was playing in an Edinburgh derby. I came off the pitch, I checked my phone and somebody had racially abused me whilst the game was going on. Um, I actually replied to that person and they then replied to me saying, I'm just trying to put you off your game. How they expected to put me off my game, I'm not sure. I don't have my phone out on the pitch, but that was their reason, that was their justification for doing it. The second time was again in an Edinburgh derby, this time at Tyne Castle. And I was warming up and somebody recorded me and racially abused me for about 10 or 15 seconds. Um, the effect it has is heartbreaking, not only on me as an individual, but also my family. You know, my mum called me in tears. I was, I think, about 30 or 31 years of age. And you've got your mum calling you from England in tears, you know, heartbroken because our son's being described this way for just going out there and trying to do his job. So, yes, it affects me, but it also affects the people around me. And, you know, it's something that I'll now live with for the rest of my life. And Leanne, you were nodding there. I think, as I understand it, you were abused less as a footballer and more since you've become a pundit. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it really it breaks my heart that it's nearly 11 o'clock at night and I would wish we'd be sitting here talking about, you know, more positive things about what was great about the England team. But the reality is, you know, serious things are happening. And, you know, for the first time two weeks ago, I didn't get abused online for the first time in four years. And I actually tweeted about it because, you know, it was something I felt like was a positive thing. But then I thought to myself, how bad is this that it's taken four years for me to not be abused, whether it be about my sexuality, my race, the colour of my skin, my um, the sex, like being a woman, you know, it's just really hard. And I think a lot of people say, oh, you know, some people might say rise above it. But as Marvin said, you know, my mum's the same. My mum used to go on social media to look at what I was doing and she deleted her accounts because she was getting hurt by what was going on and, and it's not OK. I mean, that's astounding. Four years and only one day without abuse. What do you think needs to happen? I mean, is it about the government legislating? Is it about social media's taking action? What do you think would make the difference, Leanne? I think it's a combination. I think, you know, the social media outlets need to take responsibility as well because whenever there's copyright infringements of music, they're able to take it away. Whether it's something you mentioned in COVID, they're able to, you know, flag it up and stuff like that. So more needs to be done there. But I think, unfortunately, during this pandemic, I feel like it's given people more of a voice where they think they can go and abuse people. Whether it's because people are bored, I don't know. But I also think that the government also needs to take responsibility as well because when it was raised to their attention with regards to taking the knee, it was almost like it isn't a political statement, Black Lives Matter. It's to show support for black players that we're all unified. It's not to do with politics. So I'm not quite sure why it was ever pol politics were ever brought into it. So, you know, it, it really breaks my heart that we sit here having to talk about it because, you know, walking a day in the life of someone like myself and Marvin isn't easy in life. You know, a lot of the statistics were reeled off before both of us came on the show. And to a lot of people, it's surprising. But to me, it's not because that's how we've lived our lives. And that's how it's always been. And I think to a lot of people at this moment in time, when they hear these things, they can't quite comprehend it. But it's the reality of, of the way it is right now in England. And Marvin, I mean, you've said in the past, you've accused social media companies of sitting on their hands, of not caring about racism. Clearly, they 
would defend themselves against that. They say they do. They say they are taking these posts down as much as they can. In your view, what would force them to act? What needs to happen? I think the government needs to do more. You know, I think Leanne touched on it there. The government needs to hold the social media companies accountable if they're unable to pass on somebody's details to the authorities when somebody's been racially abused or any, any sort of message that you kind of, you know, breaks the law. Um, if the government then say to them, if you can't pass the details on, then we'll be fining you as a company. Then what you'll find is in the morning, you'll be asked to fill in your details and upload a form of ID. When it becomes about money, when it becomes about taking money out of these companies' pockets and then paying fines, they'll sort the problem out. At this moment in time, people like myself and Liam being abused online, it probably helps them because, you know, they're being screenshotted, they're being shared. You know, you saw the, the three England players that were racially abused after the game. It's everywhere. You know, you can't miss it. You know, so it's got the Instagram logo on it. It's got the Twitter uh, logo on it. And this is all they care about. All they care about are hits. And they don't care about how these three players feel. They don't care about how me or Leanne feel when we're racially abused, how our families feel. You know, when you go to report it and you're told that it's not in violation of, of their kind of code of conduct, now, why can you even say these words first and foremost? But when I report it and you're telling me it's OK and they won't even remove, you know, the comment, I have to then block the person and delete the comment, they're just making, you know, a new account and they racially abuse me again. And until the government come down and say to the social media companies, you must do more about this, nothing's going to change. And if we turn to the politics of it, I mean, Tyrone Mings has accused the Home Secretary of stoking the fire. I wonder, Marvin, whether you agree with him. I definitely agree with him. You know, I, I felt that she added fuel to the fire, if I'm totally honest, and, and Boris Johnson did the same thing at the start. I think what you've seen now is that the England national team, through getting to the final, through the way they've played, the diversity we have within the squad, have pulled the whole nation together. You know, the politicians have seen this also. So at the start, their view was very, very different to what it was at the end. You saw at the end they were coming out about the racial abuse and saying, you know, it's not right and something needs to be done about it and people need to be held accountable. Where was this energy for the last 18 months? We've been crying out for this help. As Leanne said, you know, since COVID hit, it's got a lot, lot worse. And football as an organisation and as a family have tried their utmost, you know, to stop this and to suppress what's going on. But we've needed more help all along from the government. You know, they're not fooling anyone now by trying to jump on the bandwagon because what they've seen is the whole nation are now in uproar what has gone on with Marcus Rashford, um, Sancho and, and Saka. You know, so they've now seen this and said, well, it's time for us to react because the nation are reacting. No, no, no. They should have been reacting before because we've called out for them to help us before and their silence has been deafening. You know, so for them to now come out and say that they're going to help and they're going to try and change things, you know, actions speak louder than words for me because there was a bill passed in May or that was brought up in May and nothing's happened. What's happened with that? You know, about the safety of people online. You know, that they spoke about it and if they want to talk about token gestures, that was one because nothing's happened with it. You know, so do I believe that they'll change anything? No, I don't. Do I hope? I live in hope, obviously. And Leanne, I mean, do you, when they, those um, three players missed penalties, did you expect the level of abuse to be as bad as it has been? And what kind of impact, I guess, on a wider level, you know, when, if you're in a stadium and, and they're booing players taking the knee, what kind of impact does that have on people in the crowds, but also in the country more generally? Yeah, definitely. I think, unfortunately, when those three penalty uh, takers missed, I knew exactly what was coming and I think every person of colour knew that as well, unfortunately. And for some people, like I said before, they would see that as quite a shock, but it didn't come as a shock to me, unfortunately, because like Marvin said before, where have these people been for 18 months when we've really needed them? You know, I often go on shows and speak about racism and homophobia and I'll continue to do that, but it weighs on me. You know, it's not something I necessarily enjoy talking about, but we have to, because we have to raise awareness. So if there are people out there that say, here we go again, or turn off their TVs every time they see us speaking about it, they're also part of the problem. Because Bukayo Saka, Sancho, you know, Marcus Rashford have done unbelievable things for this country. You've got one of them that's 19 years old, you know, that's getting abused in the way that they have been just because they missed a penalty. How about people realise you know, how brave they are to step up and take one. But I wasn't surprised, unfortunately, because I've experienced it first and foremost, you know, the online abuse. There's nothing that's being done to change it. Yes, we do the boycotts, and I'm all for those types of things. But at the same time, you know, it does make an impact on you. And I hope those players, you know, they will feel positive, hopefully, today and as weeks to come, because they will see that people do support them. And there's been so much support for them in the last couple of days. And I hope that it continues, because it needs to happen. But, you I, know, it does affect you. It I, does affect you. I could talk about this all night, but unfortunately, we've got to end it. Leanne, Marvin, thank you so much for that now.
to Afghanistan, where as the last NATO troops end their mission there, the Taliban continues to retake land across the country. Today we learned that 22 Afghan commanders were executed last month by the militants as they tried to secure a town close to the border. British soldiers were deployed to Afghanistan almost 20 years ago after the 9-11 attacks as part of the US-led operation. For years, the British public bore witness to the losses, with the coffins of soldiers who died there driven through the Wiltshire town of Royal Wooden Bassett. More than 400 lost their lives in the heat of battle. As the Taliban begin to dominate once again, Sima Katecha has been asking some of the British soldiers who served there, was it worth it? British troops on the ground in Helmand. Years of risking their lives as they took on the Taliban to ensure security for the West and the Afghan people. Each patrol anxiety ridden as roads were littered with deadly improvised explosive devices. 475 British soldiers died, but nearly 20 years from the first deployment, a third of the country is back in the hands of the militants. Some of those who served now question what was the point and can the Afghan security forces cope without their support? My name's Alex Ford and I went to Afghanistan as a sergeant in the Royal Air Force. My name is Carl Tierney, um, I am um, was Army Air Corps and a Warrant Officer First Class. I worked in Joint Helicopter Force um, looking at the uh, aircraft survivability. My name's Jez Roberts, I was a uh, Marine with the Royal Marines. I went to Afghanistan attached to 3 Commando Brigade. So when you hear that the Taliban is now in control of large parts of Afghanistan and that many of its soldiers have fled the country to escape them. How does that make you feel? It's a, it's a gut, gut wrenching feeling because of, of the amount of time and effort that, you know, my fellow comrades in the Army Air Force and the Navy put in to bring in some sort of stability, certainly to our region of operations, you know, in, in Helmand. Um, and it, it kind of makes it all pointless, really. Initially, I would felt disappointed. Um, I, I, losing friends and colleagues that, that served in Afghan with me and also prior and, and post when I, when I was there. Um, it seems as though it was all in vain. And, you know, their lives were lost ultimately for what? Are you confident that the Afghan security forces can protect their own people. When I was there, they were poor. Um, they were generally conscripts from the north that were taken, dropped into the south, dropped into a small checkpoint somewhere and told to, to guard that area. And they had no link with that area. And as a result, they were, they, they just didn't care enough about it. Um, I'm not surprised that troops have that the, the ANA of there have gone and decided to go home because that's what they really want to care about. They care about their families and they don't care about areas that they have no uh, connection to. I, I, I think it's, 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 it's fruitless in having an expectation of the Afghan forces because they've got no backup. There's not nothing. There's nothing to back them up like we've had in theatre when we were there. And so it, it's an impossible ask. And you know what? That would be an impossible ask of anybody. If you put the British Army into Afghanistan without air support, intelligence or communication support, exactly the same thing would happen. I just want to put a quote to you. The former um, Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, recently said, those who came here 20 years ago in the name of fighting extremism and terrorism not only failed to end it, but under their watch, extremism in Afghanistan has flourished. That is what I call failure. Do you think NATO has failed? I guess so then, yeah. By that statement, they have. And how does that make you feel, Jez, when you think about that? Well, I'm disappointed. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm gutted about it, but... Um, the other thing you have to say is, 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 where do you draw the line? How long do we keep troops there for? How, you know, when does it end? I don't think NATO failed. I think the politicians failed every step along the way. There was no joined up, long, thought out plan for what was actually going to happen and how they were going to deal with things. 
and they were constantly, the politicians were constantly firefighting between saying what they were to the troops on the ground and then saying what they were to people at home. I don't think that individual troops failed at all. More than 400 British soldiers were killed in Afghanistan, leaving families devastated. They were your comrades. A big question, was the war worth it? No, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. The, the heartache that's been felt and the devastation. Um, you know, I, I've, I've got a couple of close friends who, you know, um, lost limbs and they've now got a, a life of suffering. And like I said before, for, for ultimately, the country could slip back to its its ways like it has done in history in, and history has proved that. So, no, I don't think it was worth it. You know, it's really sad the way that, that, that this has panned out. And, you know, you do sit there and you, you look at what we did. Um, I look at what I did in my six months there and thought, you know, uh, you know, people have got got water at least you know that that's the only thing that they've got out of it but is that worth it is that worth those two guys that were in the company that I was attached to dying plus the god knows how many others that I think it was 25 percent that got injured in one way or another and then all the ones that have had mental health problems since they came back I don't know that's something I'm gonna have to think about later at night I think it just conjures up this image in my mind of what was it for? You know, why Why did we do that? Well, I, I don't understand what the end goal was because because if if the end goal was to get us to where we are today with with a peace accord with the Afghan um, government and also the Taliban and the Taliban taking over all the areas that we'd, we brought back some stability to, then it seemed like it, the whole episode was pointless. That's all from us tonight. Emily will be back tomorrow. Good night.